Well, there you go. Let's play you in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our inaugural culture cast with the OG Arabian Prince. Happy down, darn new year. And OG Arabian Prince, can I call you Rab? Yeah, Rab you call, call me Rab. That's what everybody Excellent. calls me. Um, I'd love to welcome you. And there's about 100 other people that I can see who have decided to join us. There's a mix of CEOs from Fortune 500, startup Ooh. companies, tech nice. companies, and a lot of great people who are artists, um, entrepreneurs, and all of what they have in common is that they're passionate about just building cultures where people can thrive. And that's kind of what we're talking about today. And so um, super excited to have you, Rab, and to have you join me as the first guest to really talk about being a pioneer in culture. And before we jump into it, I would love for everyone to understand, while many of people who are on here right now are just such fans because you are OG from an NWA standpoint, but I'd love for you to kind of talk about, okay, that may have been who you have been when you were 16 and in Compton, but talk about like the breadth of what you've been dabbling in since then. Like, what is it? Ooh, well, you know, I always tell people because people always ask me, how did you go from rap or hip hop to technology and all of the other things that you've been doing? I'm like, you guys been sleeping. I've been doing this since day one. I've been making, you know, animation and visual effects and video games since I was 16. You know, so it was part of that journey for me when I was younger. But there was no Internet. There was no social media back then in the early to mid 80s. So all of that kind of stuff, no one knew. And also on top of it, it wasn't cool and hip to be a nerd back then. So I had to kind of hide it a little bit. So it's cool now though. Oh, it's cool. Yeah. Nerds yeah. are cool. Yeah. Like they're man, real cool. Oh yeah. So you were doing all this stuff at 16. Who would have thought? Here you yeah, are. So, like uh, I mean as a thug, not a thug, but you know what I mean, like in the hood. In well, you know how it started? It was it was interesting. So I was the kid in the neighborhood that knew how to use the synthesizers, knew how to use the DJ equipment at 15 or 16. So when everybody was kind of getting into DJing and kind of getting into actually starting to make records, everybody would call me because I knew how to use the gear. So I was in the studio with a lot of the up and coming artists who ended up being big in the studio helping them set up their gear even producing and doing a lot of their stuff and you know i had a computer before it was cool to have a computer you know and i was using that computer to program and sequence music but then i found out really quickly like oh wait a minute what's this stuff oh i can learn how to code and if i can code then i can do more cool stuff i can write plugins or i could do this and then i started messing with video games like hey, I can actually teach myself how to make video games and do animation. So I kind of did all of that kind of stuff because I had so much time on my hands because all I was doing is sitting in the studio all day. That's amazing. And so you went from um, being a complete nerd, of course, studying is what I'm hearing you talk about, and dabbling in creating video games, playing video games, coding. Um, to what has that turned into today? Like, So what have you been up to? Oh, my goodness. So, you know, after making music and, you know, doing video games and a bunch of animation projects over the years, I'm actually still doing all of those things and more. I'm the CEO of a company called MD Dow, which is an interactive medical. I hate to use word metaverse because I don't really believe in metaverse as okay. people call it because I just say interactive web, because if you think about it, people go, oh, the metaverse is coming. Every kid that plays Fortnite, that plays Roblox, that is, you know, they've been in the metaverse for years. Even when I was playing video games, I still do to this day. So don't tell nobody. But, you know, being an RPG player, playing yes. um, EverQuest and Astronauts Call and all of those RPG games back in the day till now, we are in the metaverse. Like we lived in there every single day. Like even to this day, every day I log into a couple of games. And I'm playing against people or with people that I know. Yeah. That's the metaverse. So there's nothing new about it. It's just being opened up to the masses now. So, you know, I've been in this forever. And, you know, now that I'm the CEO of this medical endeavor, we want to bring an interactive 
web that's more community based so mm -hmm. people can have more of a easier way to get health care. You know, we want to bring health care to the lowest common denominator and um, make it accessible for everybody. That's great. You're also a CEO of a high performance racing company that's also a, a DAO, a distributed autonomous organization. What is that? Yeah. So um, one of my doctor partners introduced me to another doctor who was passionate about electric vehicles. He okay. drives Teslas and he's totally passionate about pushing the whole um, autonomous, um, sustainable, green, you know what I mean? Um, that kind of a future for transportation. So he said, man, I, I, I saw your guy, you know, Arabian, and I think he would be perfect to help us with this project. Do you mind if we steal him part time to be the CEO of our thing, which is called um, Driven Performance? And what our vision is, is to build the first ever carbon neutral racetracks for electric vehicles. So people will be able to take their vehicles, their electric vehicles out onto the track, not only to race them, but to learn how to really drive these cars properly, because there are so many accidents with people in these yeah. electric vehicles because they're like go-karts. They have no combustion. You push on the gas pedal, yeah. it goes. And, you know, Tesla's on a track, a regular track are beating Ferraris and Lamborghinis in the quarter mile because it's all torque. So you have to kind of teach people how to be safe with these things. So we're in the process of building our first tracks um, pretty soon this year. So, yeah, I got a lot on my plate. That is so wild. I know. I will we'll totally jump into it because I know there is so much that you have been up to. I mean, my husband, Michael, and I were traveling. I think you and I talked about this. We were back in Doha and Dubai for the World Cup. And it's like there is OG Arabian Prince all over the place, you know, in the DJ scene in Saudi Arabia, which – We'll get into, but going back to Web 3.0, since I know I'm still new and learning all of this, and um, can you talk about what a DA, a, a distributed autonomous organization really means from yeah. uh, what it means in, in Web 3.0? Yeah, so uh, a DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, pretty much, if, if you want to really simplify it, it's a community of people who vote on what is. And I put okay. what is as a question mark. So we vote on what is it supposed to be and whatever it is could be anything like there are dials on this. I'm a golfer. So there's a golfing dial where they built this organization where people voted on what golf courses to play or what golf course can they build? I think they're actually raising money to buy a golf course. So oh, wow. um, there's dials on building new properties or, you know, it's a bunch of people getting together to vote on what's next. And that's pretty much as simple as I can put it. And that's what we're doing with our medical and actually with the racing. I love that. I love that you pointed that out because that goes right into the heart of what we want to talk about, which is culture, you know, culture cast. It is about people who are passionate about creating cultures where everyone in it can actually thrive. And you talked about this notion of community and in all the scenes that you've been a part of, you know, going back to the day where everyone at least knows you publicly from back then until now, you know, the music scene, video games, um, technology, coding, creating all these projects, being part of Web 3.0 and bringing that to the mainstream. What I'm hearing you talk about is these communities that people are a part of. And so when we think about culture, I think about the word community. How would you define culture? No matter what scene you've been in, you've been in, how culture, would you define yeah, it? How, so to me, culture, first and foremost, is community. I always use the word community, community and culture, you know, the things that you grew up on, whether and culture doesn't always have to be, you know, part of your heritage. It doesn't have to be, you know, a, a thing that's your race. Mm -hmm. It's your culture, where you grew up, how you live, the the city or the world region that you live in. You know, you have there's so many cultural things that are, you know, um, embraced by the Hispanics, the blacks, the Asian communities. Each Asian community has their own culture, but they have something that they share in common as a culture. So culture is kind of complicated. And that's why I travel around the world. Like when mm -hmm. I go to the Middle East and to the region, I'm there because the Middle East is now opening themselves up 
to the rest of the world. They're, they're opening themselves up to music. And what's interesting is they're getting into electronic music. They're getting into hip hop. And you have to go there and be a part of it to have them understand the culture of hip hop, but also yeah. to preserve their own internal culture of the Middle East and the region. So it's a fine kind of mix. It's a fine wine that you mix together, bringing a bunch of different cultures together to create something new. So for me, culture is something that has to be preserved mm -hmm. and handled very, very lightly with uh, kick gloves. Yeah, I, I love how you're talking about it. It is about preserving culture. And in the context of, I'm going to say, um, pop culture, the culture where people grow up in or neighborhoods, what I'm hearing you say is it's actually recognizing that people bring different backgrounds and thinking from how they grew up or from where they live. And that actually becomes part of a community that they're becoming a part of. And if you want to talk specifically about, you know, the, the music scene in Saudi Arabia or hip hop, and like they're bringing that in because they're open to it. But then I hear you talk about too, like there's a very specific Saudi or Middle Eastern culture too that you need to honor. And so how do you bring the two together? And, you know, I think as it applies to corporate America, where I've had the chance to be a leader of service and serving communities in that, you know, I've always thought about corporate cultures in the same way. So it's like, yes, you recognize what's the purpose and vision for the company, but you also can't forget that at the end of the day, the people who you're serving, so the employees inside the company, are really a reflection of the consumers or the guests or the customers that that company is either creating a product for or delivering a service to. And like recognizing what they bring to the table also shapes that culture. So I'm just trying to I'd translate that. I think that's really super interesting. I think about too, um, you are, have always been on the forefront. You know, you have been on the hip hop scene and, you know, video games and even Web 3.0 at the beginning of seeing something. And when you think about shaping culture, you know, what are those influences that shape culture beyond what you do specifically? Like, for example, I think about music culture and I'm really dating myself when I say this, but the role of MTV. Right. So back then there was radio and there were records. And then, you know, people would listen to the radio. And I know I used to do this, get my tape recorder out and tape stuff that I would like because I couldn't afford to buy it until you can go to the record store, which don't exist anymore. And then like here comes MTV. And I just would love to get your perspective on to me that kind of um, not disrupted or maybe it did, but helped to define the music scene and the music culture. So, I mean, tell me about what you thought of that, but then are, are there other examples like that in other cultures that you can think of? Yeah, I mean, you know, for us, me growing up in Compton and being part of that community, which, you know, turned out to be one of the bigger influences on hip hop to looking at how we influence things across the world. You know, I often talk about NWA is the funniest thing that people always look at NWA and what we've done and they say, what were you guys thinking about? Like, you guys must have been in the studio, you know, like profits. And I'm like, no, we were hungry. We wanted to eat. So we wanted to make music. And, you know, it was as simple as that. We were just in there having fun making music, but not knowing that our showcasing of our culture in Compton and yeah. the things that were going on in our hood across the country changed things. And even across the world, because now you've got kids in suburbia playing straight out of Compton and other songs of ours and the government getting involved and the FBI getting involved and trying to stop what we were talking about. We didn't know it was going to be something that big. Wow. And even to this day, it's still continuing on. And that's what I talk about when I go to the Middle East, when I go to Africa and you see the influences on their culture, how they dress, the music they listen to all started from a couple of little places in LA and New York, you know, and that's how culture can change things in the world. It's actually giving, I would say, a key to the bank of getting people out of these inner cities and these hoods and these ghettos, because a lot of them didn't have a way out. They either yeah. had to be a sports star 
or had to be really smart or they had to rob and steal or sell drugs. But now, you know, music and culture, and I'm not even talking about musical culture because culture goes to art and fashion. There, there are people like, um, you know, rest in peace to Virgil Abloh with yep. Off-White and going on to be the creative director of Louis Vuitton and things like that. You know, he came from the hood. Yep. So, and his desire of changing style and and dress and fashion from a cultural, you know, urban standpoint propelled him to the highest standpoint that you could possibly get to. So, yeah, it's it's very important. And I'm there to push it every day. That's why I'm building these amazing tech centers across the country for kids to give them the tools so that they can open their minds and expand their visions to do whatever they want to do. Yeah. Talk about these tech centers. I know we haven't talked about that specifically. What are you doing and why are you doing it? Um, I'm doing it because I know who I am. <laughs> I was this little kid who grew up in Compton, who had crazy uncles and cousins who were actually the ones doing all of the dirt and yeah. craziness in the hood who didn't want me out there with them. So they fill my room and my mind with Back then, I wouldn't call it as much technology, but it was, you know, synthesizers and records and record players and stereo systems and ham radios. They were giving me stuff in the 70s that was electronic stuff to keep me from being in the streets. And that's what really, really defined who I am today. And for me, I'm doing the same thing with these kids. Like we just put 89 computers in Inglewood School District to teach kids how to use Unreal Engine. Yeah. which is what they used for Mandalorian. They use it for video games. We put those things in. We put a little eSport area in there. And then another project I'm working with is Sola Beehive, which is in the inner city in um, South Central. We put a full-blown eSport, like eSport facility, robotics, film, television, music, culture. It's like a huge 100, 200,000 square feet building. And everybody from Oprah Winfrey to Riot Games to Jimmy Iovine to the Kings and everybody else is involved in that project. Amazing. So I just want to keep kids off the streets and I want to build a whole bunch of me because I want them to be <laughs> the next Elon Musk and the next, next Richard Branson's, you know, because these kids, man, they have ideas, but they just don't have the resources to um, execute. Yeah, I think... I mean, I know RIP Virgil Abloh, and I think about the story you tell about his um, ability to bring street design to the masses and to luxury and actually make it more appealing to people, no matter what social background they're from. Um, I I'm hearing you talk about building these tech centers and also creating something that's relatable, aspirational and accessible to these young kids, you right. know? So it's like, here's this luxury, which by the way, you can be a part of because you're trying to encourage them. Actually, I hope you're interested in this because you too can like learn these skills and um, go and become, you know, the next version of a tech person, which is amazing. So um, I think it's really awesome that you're doing that. And I think there's a lot to say about really creating culture. And I know you and I've talked about this behind the scenes. Tell me more about like, all right, so you're creating kind of this framework for people. I believe culture is also co-creation. It's not like someone just comes in and kind of adhere to what I think. I think the more people get engaged as part of the community, and you've already said this as relates to Web3, people get to vote. Um, but, you know, Tell me your thoughts on co-creation of culture. How do you make sure, you know, in these tech centers specifically, can these kids actually shape their experience? Yeah, I think they can. Um, we have to make sure that we put the right people in place to teach, to curate, yeah. to create these um, experiences for these kids, right? Because I've been to places, I won't mention the ones I've been to, and, you know, the, everyone means well, everyone wants what they want kids to grow and learn. But sometimes you can be hung up too much on curriculum mm -hmm. and boxing kids in with a specific type of education. You know, like I, I do a lot of STEM and STEAM work with people, 
but I'm not a fan of it because, you know, STEM and STEAM is pretty much science, yeah, engineering, this, that, that. Now, what if a kid isn't interested in that? Do they not do it? Or do you allow them to explore other avenues? So I, I believe in more of an open source environment where you bring kids, you show them tools, you show them things. And then the moment you see that spark, no matter what it is, when you see that spark, you push that kid in that direction. Um, perfect example, there's a company I work with that it's a CAD program. They do, you know, 3D design for things and their um, demos for the kids was showing kids how to make buildings and how to make architectural structures. Yeah. And I'm thinking like, well, that's cool. But this same software is the same software they use to design sneakers for Nike. Nice. You know, to build um, video games, to make other things, you know, like to design bottles in fashion or clothing. So why not show kids that as well and let people have an opportunity? Because I think these big corporate companies miss the opportunity to really, really um, research what the next generation is wanting and is about. You got to research first and then push to that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And again, I'm going to nerd for a little bit. I, you know, you're talking about the importance of inclusion and the importance of diversity. And I think it's interesting when I know you've worked with large companies as well, and they want to increase their access to diversity through STEM programs. But what I'm hearing you say is it's almost like they're over programming it versus what you know, talk about the notion of open source, right? Like I think about this next generation and, you know, I was reading something this morning, how like even with unemployment being so low and all these layoffs happening right now, there's th still 3 million jobs in the U S that can't be filled today, right? It's in healthcare, it's in tech, and it's in certain very skilled blue collar work. And I think about this next generation that you are tapping into right now, you know, these young kids, Gen post Z, right? They're not even in the workforce right now. Like, what is it that they want to do? And how do you help relate to them and help them want to create a skill they want to build, you know, have for themselves so that they can make their way in life? And so I think about this notion of inclusion and diversity. First of all, go ask the people what it is they need and want and show them, you know, the possibilities versus go and build a building, right? I'm hearing you talk about, heck yeah. I mean, who knew that that same technology can help you design sneakers, yeah. you know, or video games? What the yeah. heck? Yeah, you got to show kids it all, like, you know, even engineering. Like, there's so many different things that fall under the category of engineering. But yet and still, when you say engineering to a kid, it sounds yeah. boring because the people that are teaching it are only teaching you how to be, uh, you know, like I said, build buildings or being an engineer for the space shuttle or this kind of stuff. And there's not nothing wrong with it. There's people who want to do that. But you got to op be open and show everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything. And I think that even for me, um, a lot of kids I bump into, all they care about is sports. I'm the next Kobe Bryant. I'm the next LeBron yeah. James. I'm the next, you know, um, whoever in football or soccer or whatever. But what I tell them is like, less than one percent of people you know so uh, who was it patrick beverly from the okay. lakers said something really interesting somebody was disrespecting him or something and, and patrick beverly says back like i'm one of only and i didn't know the number was this small i think he said something like i'm one of only 3300 or i don't think it's 33,000. i think it's 3300 people that have ever played in the nba Right. Shut up. Right. Right. Shut up. Yeah. Not many people have ever played on the pro level in the NBA, but every kid has this vision of being there. So if the number is that small, pretty surely you're not going to be there unless you're yeah. one in a million. You know, so what else can you do in sports? Do you get discouraged and go not do anything? Yeah. Or does somebody tell you like, hey, let's teach you all the other jobs that are in the NBA that you can be a part of just in case you don't make it. Yeah. And I think if you put that in the kid's mind before they fail, it helps them to succeed. 
I, I agree. And actually, one thing I wanted to point out, and I think about you telling your story when you were a 16 year old and what you dabbled in, right? Yes, you were telling the story with NWA straight out of Compton. At the same time, you had behind the scenes, you know, your computers, your video games, etc. And if I think about everything you're doing today, it's a reflection of who you were when you were 16. And um, I know I mentioned this to you at another call. I had the chance to be part of um, a roundtable with Jim Collins, you know, the, the author of Good to Great, you know, that yeah. what makes good companies great. And he was doing some research on the notion of reinvention and really people and themselves. And, you know, he took us through this exercise on like who people who here have really reinvented themselves and what are you doing now? And I think what I took away from that whole roundtable from others and from him specifically is that this benchmark of a successful person is a reflection of doing what you were passionate about. Oh, around this time you were a kid. And so, you know, six adolescents, 16. And so I love that whole, I get that there's aspirational goals of like being an NBA player, but how do you help kids these days, right? The future of um, this, this future talent, right? We're trying to create a sustainable system, future talent. How do you help them just really be confident in what it is that they're passionate about and then put stuff in front of them that will help them express that and learn yeah. more of that? And I think that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm really good at making big corporate companies and investors and donors feel very, very bad. I'm like, look at you, big old company. What are you doing? supporting like you know I always talked about what we talked about yesterday it's like oh yeah you're you're yeah. into doing stuff for diversity oh the one little event you did oh let's have an event on diversity let's get some kids in let's do this blah 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 and then right. with a t-shirt what's the end game like they do stuff to get accolades that they can put on their website or they can show people look what we did you didn't do anything you just did something for your pr or for your marketing you really want to do something, do something that's sustainable. And what we're doing is we're looking at the end game. Like, yeah. okay, Unreal Engine is a tool that if you teach a kid in high school that probably was never going to college in the first place, that when they finish learning this, Disney will hire them. And we got the curriculum from Disney. So Disney Amazing. told us what they needed. And we said, okay, well, we'll put the computers in. We'll put the software in and we will teach these kids this. And Disney was like, if they learn it, we will hire them because we need more people doing this. And that's what I'm looking at. What does these, what do these big companies need? The Disney's, the Google's, the Apple's, what do they need? And let's teach the kids that, right? Um, uh, you know, like you're going to teach kid basic math, going to teach kids about history, which is important. Right. What about teaching them something in high school that's going to give them a career because 70% of kids don't go to college. Yeah. So if I you don't teach it. them in high school, then you just put them out there in the world. Why not teach them these things? They're smart. These kids have computers yeah. in their pocket. At what? Eight years old, a kid has a computer in his pocket. He's got an iPhone or an Android phone or whatever, Samsung. They got a computer in their pocket at eight to 10 years old. And with Google and what's the other chat, GPT or whatever it's called chat right now. GPT. Oh, oh my God. God. You can General say Rivea. anything to that right. thing and it will answer the question. I want to build a rocket. It will tell you, I want you to write this thing. So there is no more excuses for being successful in this world. Zero excuses. I love and it. I tell kids that parents and teachers don't tell them. They're always telling them, oh, it's hard or you need to work hard. I tell kids, no, it's easy. You know why it's easy? Because everything you want to do is on the internet. If you're passionate about something, study it and you'll succeed. I mean, word up on that. And actually, one thing I do want to add on that, since I know there's a lot of corporate folks on here and, you know, we talk about the buzzword of upskilling, right? I love that you talk about creating sustainability for talent for the future, right? And I think about, you know, companies, especially ones where I've worked where there's a large workforce of hourly people who also want to emerge to this middle class. And why can't we do the same thing for them to really provide that roadmap, right, of, hey, come and learn this. And I get it, you know, the notion when you're younger, that you're adept and it's quick to adapt. But I think there's the same that companies can be doing as well to give access to that ability to upskill and, you know, grow your skills to grow with the company. Right. Yeah, yeah, I love that. 
Oh my gosh. I know we are coming up at like 30 minutes and I know we plan on talking 30 minutes. Just a couple of more questions. You know, we talk about culture and you'd mentioned this too, like um, how music ha has actually opened up eyes to people around the world. And you're talking about Africa specifically and how like fashion was influenced, you know, from music in LA and New York. And I think just fashion influences me just in general. So, I mean, I know every time I see you, you're always wearing something crazy. SpongeBob. But, like, I mean, yeah, <laughs> SpongeBob. But let's talk about like, all right, what are you wearing these days? Like, what are what's your fave? I mean, I'm still like 90% SpongeBob. Honestly. Okay. Like, every single, pretty much every day I wear something SpongeBob. And people are like, you're a freaking 57-year-old man wearing <laughs> SpongeBob. I'm like, I've worked hard. So I should be able to wear what I want to wear. So I, yeah. like, I just like SpongeBob. It, it keeps me light. It, it's fun. Um, a lot of big brands now are making SpongeBob and other other cartoon stuff for adults. Rick and Morty. You, we we talked about the what's it three NY. Oh yeah, three NY. I know yeah. Sam's on here. Oh yeah, my god. Hey Sam, I'm giving you. Look at that. I'm promoting for three <laughs> NY. What do I get? Do I get a T-shirt? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But yeah, anyway, you're giving everyone you know. my secrets on like the very specific unique clothes that I find. Yeah. 3NY yeah. and Soho, my friends. Yeah, but it's 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 the thing that I want to be an original. I'm a, you know, like I said, we talked earlier. I'm a self-proclaimed futurist. I'm a C-list celebrity, but a self-proclaimed futurist. And I don't care about fame. I don't care about whatever. I do what I do. I wear what I like. And I'm on a golf court, golf course. I'm, I'm a, you know, semi-pro golfer. So when I play in these pro-ams or these tournaments, I'm wearing yeah. SpongeBob and I don't care. Yes. And, you know, and also I, I, I tell one running joke about wearing spongebob you know because i'm from nwa and i drive fancy cars and i get pulled over my, by the police if i get pulled over and step out the car and spongebob well, i'm a threat like really like that's really. Like, so I'm a excellent threat. <laughs> uh, well i mean okay i hear you i think the same i see many people on here making comments who i've had the chance to work with like for the last two decades and, you know, I think I've always rolled in with, with what I want to wear. And I think it just throws people off. And part of it is uh, be be you and be, be you. proud of who you are and just be confident in who you are. And I think confidence comes from, like, feeling good and what it is that you're wearing because you're feeling it, right? I yeah. love it. One thing I'm going to say, too, is really yeah. quickly is um, I deal with a lot of investors and startups, right? And I think part of the fail of you know, FTX and all of the crazy things that are going on with investments and startups right now is the fact that people get so into this stereotype of what a CEO or what a founder looks like, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. a lot of money goes to a startup that has Harvard or Princeton or Yale graduates, and they have this amazing deck and all of these accolades and all of these yeah. things, and they're wearing a suit and tie. And then they get all the money and then it fails. But then you look at the CEOs today of most of the billion dollar companies or most of the, you know, the companies, the unicorn companies, these guys are wearing sneakers and a t-shirt. So you got to look past what somebody looks like yeah. and really, really look at the product that they're bringing forth to market and also look at what people need. So, you know, like it may be somebody that doesn't know how to market their product or even yeah. how to build their product, but they might have something amazing. Help them. Yes. Right? And I think these, you know, investors get lazy and they just want to get the next best thing by not doing much, but we all have amazing resources. And if there's an amazing idea, we have to help them, especially people from diversity and inner cities and, you know, lower, you know, regions and rural regions, there are ideas everywhere and we need to embrace them. I love that. I think that's actually one of the closing questions that I wanted to ask, which is advice you would get every, give everyone here. I mean, I'm seeing all these great comments on people just resonating with what you're saying. I think one piece of advice that I'm hearing is one way to build culture is how do you help people? Like literally when people feel lost or they don't know that they belong, look past it and find a way to reach out, right? And ask ask them how you can be helpful to them. What other advice would you like a executable step or thing that people can do on this call 
to be successful at pioneering culture? Yeah, in your city, wherever you're at, you know, okay. at your at your business, at your office, you know, like look and see what's needed. Like it's, especially at some of these schools, these schools need so much help. I go to some of these schools and I'm like, is that the same book that I had in 1980? <laughs> like, really? I am not lying. I walked in, I walked in Inglewood High School and I'm like, whoa, this is the nice. same hallway that I walked through years ago when I came over here and DJ at a party. Like it's, you know, they're starting to get money so they can yeah. you know, become more efficient and newer, but it's sad what these kids are having to deal with every day when they learn. And we really have to do better at putting the tools out there okay. for the next generation. I mean, because I'm old and I'm getting older. I need some of these young kids to take care of me and do something so I can have a comfortable, <laughs> comfortable retirement. You know, we can't yeah. just let them go by the wayside. Well, a good place to start then is in our own cities, in our communities. What can we do to help that next generation? Bingo. Um, all right. As we close, I do want to get into what are you up to next? I'm super excited for you just to at least share this really quickly. Yeah, what so do you we, talk, we talked about all the business stuff, all yeah. the you know, foo foo stuff, but. <laughs> me and me and my buddy, Mr. Ice-T, and another one of my buddies, Tommy the Animator, we have created a new animated project that's about to reap the world. We're about to take over the world with this new animated project. So we have a production company. We partner with a really, really big, 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 big company called Buddha Jones. It's the number one trailer um, slash advertising company for film and television. And we're bringing something that's about to change the world as far as animation. And um, yeah, that that's coming like really, really, really soon. Oh, We're about to start shopping MG. this right now. And every, when I say everybody's in it, everybody's in it. Like we got Dr. Dre doing the music. We Stop got it. Buster yeah. Rhymes and Tracy Morgan. And I mean, even Coco's in it. We got everybody in this thing. It, it's, I love it's it. a crazy, crazy, amazing, amazing um, animated piece. All right. When this hits the world and you take everybody by storm, y'all are coming back on and let's talk about the culture you're creating with this new animated project. I'm yeah, super excited it. about this. Thank I you. mean, that is like the definition of inclusion and diversity and innovation. And so I want to thank you, first of all, for being part of this inaugural culture cast. Inaugural. Hey, this yes. is a Wait, isn't this the second time we've done something inaugural? Cause we, with your old company, I was yes. the first over there. Right? Not? You were like the OG. There's That's a reason right. why you're the OG. Always the OG. Um, <laughs> always the OG. I mean, you are the source, my friend. But I also just want to thank you for um, being this futurist in every scene you've been a part of and actually creating sustainable cultures. I think there's kind of a learning and a theme that I keep getting every time I meet with you that the role we all have in creating sustainability for people in the cultures that we're a part of is really important. And so um, I'm going to say happy new year to you and everyone as you, for those of you who recognize Chinese new year, that's coming up on January 22nd. It is the year of the rabbit I'm kind of wearing the rabbit. I don't know if you can tell. I'm actually anyway. going to be in Vegas for that. Because they sent me something in my email like, hey, what? come to Vegas for the year of the rabbit. Because, yeah. I'm gonna okay, go. we'll meet you in Vegas for the year of the rabbit. Yeah. But I think the year of the rabbit signifies a few things. So, and I'll leave everyone with this. It represents hope. It represents peace. And it also represents prosperity. And I think all three of those things, you've given us that inspiration, OG Arabian Prince, my friend Rab. Thank you so much for spending time you. with us today. I really appreciate you. And I'm so happy to see, I mean, all the people on this on this chat who have been here. I mean, literally decades of people that I've gotten the chance to know and love and learn from. Thank you for being on here. Really appreciate seeing all of you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.